everybody, and welcome to NBA TV Basketballography. I'm Andre Aldridge. Back in the 1950s, certain players were revolutionizing the NBA game with their signature plays. There was Bill Russell and his intimidating block shots, Bob Cousy and his flashy behind-the-back passes, and one man became one of the pioneers of the jump shot. He's the subject of today's show, Hall of Famer Paul Arizon. Now, Paul used his textbook jumper to build a storybook career. He was a 10-time All-Star, a two-time NBA scoring champion, and one of the 50 greatest players in NBA history. He was also one of those rare players who spent his entire career in one city, Philadelphia. Paul honed his skills on the local playgrounds. He even developed his line drive jumpers playing in gyms with low ceilings. But when he tried out for his high school team, he was cut. It didn't seem he had much of a future in the game of basketball. I never did play in high school. I guess I was at best a good intramural player. When I left high school, I entered Villanova as a chem major. Not, nothing to do with basketball, strictly a student type. And during that year, which was right after the Second War, 46, 47, there was a lot of extremely good independent leagues in the Philadelphia area. And I played in every one I could. And I think the fact that I played so often led to any improvement that I may have shown. After my freshman year, I was offered a scholarship at Villanova, and quite frankly, all I hoped to do was be able to be a reasonable part of the team. I never even dreamt of becoming the, the star of that team. I thought I just wanted to make it, be able to make a contribution and earn my scholarship. But I was fortunate in that at Villanova, the team was very, very good prior to my being there. And my forte, I guess, was shooting and scoring and rebounding. And the players on our team were extremely smart, extremely intelligent, and they needed scoring. And I was able to provide what they needed. And I played basketball in my last three years there. Paul became Villanova's leading scorer and was the college player of the year in 1950. But he wasn't thinking of a pro career. He was concentrating on his studies. I thought I would be some sort of a chemist. As I said, and I liked chemistry, but then when I started playing basketball my sophomore year, the lab network in chemistry got so heavy that I switched to accounting, and I graduated with an accounting degree. And as I said, the whole time I spent at Villanova, I never ever, the NBA was in its infancy then, and I never ever ever thought of playing pro ball. I thought I'd get myself a job somewhere in accounting and probably still play ball someplace in independent leagues or whatever was around because I did like to play. Paul's hometown Philadelphia Warriors thought he could play at a higher level. They selected him in the NBA draft, but even then, he wasn't ready to change his career plans. My initial reaction was I really didn't care that much because I had no great desire to play pro ball. I knew I was more worried about, you know, my education, getting a good job, getting started in business, and I knew somewhere I'd be playing ball, whether it was the YMCA or the Philadelphia Warriors. So it was no great expectation, nothing like happens today where they have interviews and have special room dedicated to that. I guess I was rather blah. And since I was drafted, I figured uh, I had seen the NBA play. I used to go to the games when I was in Philly. And I thought I'd like to give it a shot and see how I would do. And I figured a year or two, maybe if I don't make it, I'm losing a year or two, which, which is not that big a deal. And because in my own mind, despite the fact that I had had a very good college career, I was really unsure as to how I would do in the NBA. Fortunately, I feel I was in the right place at the right time, being in Philly. Eddie Gottlieb, who was both the owner and the coach, liked me, and he gave me every chance in the world. After getting drafted, it was time to sign a contract. In an era long before player agents, Paul had to do his own negotiating, and he drove a hard bargain. I had no idea what the salaries were, and that day, salaries were pretty much kept a secret. You didn't know how Joe Fulks was the star of the team. I had no idea what Joe was making, but the idea of $10,000 came into my mind. A nice round figure, okay, $10,000, because college graduates at that time, as I'm talking about 1950, I guess a starting salary was between three and $5,000 a year with a bachelor's degree. So I thought $10,000 was a nice improvement. 
So in my talking with Eddie, Eddie had a an office over a movie in Philadelphia on Chestnut Street. And I went up there with my father and he said, well, what do you think you should get? And I mentioned $10,000 and he laughed. He broke out laughing. He said, if I give you $10,000, the league's going to be bankrupt. He said, well, you'll break the whole team. Because at that time, there was a ceiling per team that the, the total salary of the 10 players couldn't exceed $50,000, which is much. So I just said, well, Ed, I'll think it over. And then we came back and renegotiated. And really, I got my $10,000. And I was surprised I did. And to be very, very blunt with you, if I hadn't have gotten it, I don't think I'd have played it. I just said, because it was not that important to me. And I would have got try to get a job and go on from there. And as a special bonus, my bonus was the movie theater downstairs. Eddie knew the, the people who owned it, and he got me in the movie for nothing. So that was my bonus, not, not thousands of dollars. The Philadelphians send Paul Harrison down the middle, and it's two more big points for the former Villanova eight. My problem when I was playing ball, if I had one, was I, I used to get short of breath very quickly. But there were various opinions. I guess some of them thought I was ready to drop dead, which I really wasn't. And it certainly wasn't asthma. It was probably just a shortage of breath due to maybe clogged sinuses. And in those days, you didn't go to, you went to the doctor when you were, that was the step before the undertaker. <laughs> we, uh, you just went out and you played if you felt like you could play. And uh, <laughs> I heard some guys say they were afraid to play me too closely because they might catch what I had. <laughs> Whatever it was I had, I don't know. Something else he couldn't shake was his nickname. Ayersen became known as Pitchin' Paul, but he was never fond of the label. Well, no one I ever knew ever called me Pitchin' Paul. To Ayersen, and Pitchin' Paul gets two of his 24 point cards. It's a nickname that, like Wilt's nickname of Wilt the Stilt, which he absolutely hated. As I said, I never cared or never liked for like that nickname. In fact, the only nickname I ever really had when I was playing ball during my first couple of years with the Warriors, they used to call me the Leaper because I was a pretty good jumper. Yet Pitch and Paul was the name that stuck. But Arizon refused to let anyone know how he felt about it, especially his opponents. The old story, don't tell them about your weakness. I never liked it, but as I said, the more fuss you make out of it, the more liable you are to get ribbed on it or kitted on it, so I just dropped it. But nobody ever addressed me as that, or God, they better not address me as pitching Paul. Paul Arizon of Philadelphia, another superlative star, one of the outstanding scorers of the game. With the Warriors, he's thrilled countless fans with his firehouse enthusiasm and fantastic jump shots. Just give it to Paul and you've got yourself a basket. I was really categorized as a jump shooter by some people falsely, the first of the jump shooters. I was definitely not. Joe Fawkes, Beale Smalley, Kenny Sailors, people like that were shooting a jump shot long before I did. I guess the way it came about, I was always a pretty good one-hand shooter. And this was an era when coaches didn't like one-hand shooters. Everybody I played with was a two-hand set shooter. And I spent a lot of hours trying to become a two-hand set shooter rather unsuccessfully, I'm afraid. But I could always shoot one-handed. And as I mentioned before, I was always a good jumper. I could always jump in. A lot of the players who played against me said I used to be able to hang in the air. They, I would go up with them and they would go up and then they'd come down and I'd still be there. I don't know whether that's true or not. I just jumped and when I saw an opening, I took the shot. Paul Arizon rings the bell on a jump shot. I did shoot a lot of the jump shots, but I, I don't think I was, by any stretch of the imagination, strictly a jump shooter. What I really wanted to do, every time I got the ball, I had the ball, I wanted to drive in and make a layup. My philosophy being, it's much easier to shoot from two or three feet away than it is for 15 or 20 feet away. Plus, when you're driving, your chances of getting fouled are much greater. And if you look at my records, I made nearly as many foul shots as I did field goals during my career. So as my career progressed, I developed a fairly decent outside shot. I like to shoot outside shots. But I don't shoot jump shots the way they shoot them today. I never, you see a lot of flat-footed jump shots. 
the ball comes around, they move it around, the guy catches it and shoots it. I never shot a jump shot except off a dribble. I was always dribbling into the basket, and the reason I did that is because I felt the dribble, again, took me closer, and I had an easier shot. A flat, if I was flat-footed and they weren't playing me close, I'd shoot up just a plain one-hander, but not a jump shot. But there was one big obstacle for Paul and the rest of the league in the early 1950s, the Minneapolis Lakers' George Mikan. He was the Babe Ruth of that time. His team always won. They always did pretty much what they wanted. And any time you beat them, it was very, very satisfying. In fact, two of my most satisfying games in the history of since I've been playing in the NBA were the first two All-Star games. Roll call for the NBA's annual East-West All-Star game. A trio of Philadelphia Warriors from left to right, Paul Arizon, Joe Fox, and Andy Phillips. Both times, Mikan was with the West, and we were with the East, obviously. Cousy, McCauley, myself, folks, Philip, and we beat the heck out of the West both times. Watch the fancy pass off by Cousy. The on-rushing Paul Arizon lays it in. Arizon, incidentally, is named the All-Star Game's most valuable player. And to my way of thinking, that was so satisfying that anybody could, and especially in an all-star game status, beat Big George like that. Because again, he was sort of mythical in his reputation in the league at that time. The Warriors' Mr. Wonderful, Paul Arison, sets and shoots. The ball swishes the net. My second year, I had dethroned George Mike in his historic championship. I have, that's 51-52. Paul Arison of the Philadelphia Warriors. A former All-American from Villanova, Paul Arizon this year ended the four-year reign of Mikan as top scorer of the NBA. That was a big deal, not to me, but most of the reporters are all, there's nobody ever disowned George. I was like, you know, beating the Yankees in baseball. After two seasons, Paul was called to serve in the armed forces in 1952, but he still had a chance to compete in basketball. I was drafted in the Marine Corps. And this was during Korea, so they were guys were getting shot over there, and they they assigned me to Quantico. And another interesting point about that is this would be March of '53 when the Korean War was still in full swing. We went out to San Diego to play the San Diego Recruit Depot for the Marine Corps Championship, and we were told on going out, if you don't win, you're not coming back. You're going to Korea. And talk about playing under pressure, that is playing under pressure, okay, believe me. Fortunately, we won out there. And it was interesting that a lot of people said, well, that's two lost years, but it was two great years. I met so many great people in the Marine Corps, and I have so much respect for them, it, I, I can't describe it, that I don't think it was two lost years, it was two years well spent. In fact, my oldest son was born in Quantico, Virginia, when I was stationed at the Marine base there. After his stint in the military, Paul returned to the Warriors. The question was, could he regain his all-star form? When I came back in 54, <laughs> I was negotiating with Eddie and he said, well, he said, I don't even know if you can play anymore. But I had played in the service for two years, so I was in pretty good shape. He was thinking of cutting me. I said, you're not going to cut me. I said, the day you cut me is the day I quit. So I finally got, I think it was a $1,500 raise after winning a scoring championship. And that was a big deal on Eddie's part because $1,500 in those days was a lot of money. The Warriors had sorely missed Arizon as the team struggled during his years in the Marines. But his return signaled the start of their revival. The first year in the service, they did horribly. They won 15 games if they won that. The second year, they improved. And the third year, we were improving. We just missed the playoffs. The next year, Tom Gola joined us. And he was really, and Ernie Beck came back from the service to work as our sixth man. And they were really the, the things we needed. Philadelphia Warriors, the season's Cinderella team of big league basketball. That's Paul Arizon, a menace from any position. In there. We were the best team in the league in 1955-56, no question about it. We had the best percentage, we swept through the playoffs. This is it. The World Professional Championship is the prize at stake. Philadelphia leads 98-96 with only seconds left to play. Arizon comes through with a beauty. That just about wraps it up for the powerful Warriors. 100-96, they beat the Fort Wayne Pistons the buzzer and the Philadelphia goes on to win the NBA crown four games to one. 
and what did I get the most thrill out of? It was winning the championships. Individual honors are nice, but it's not like winning. Winning and making a positive contribution is, I think, the most satisfying thing I've ever experienced. We got along well together, we you know, socialized together, and we played good and we played hard. It's just a shame we couldn't have kept that team. But the next year, Gola was taken into service, and I missed the playoffs. I played the, the whole year of it. I took a shot in the knee from Walter Dukes, and I couldn't walk for the playoffs, and Syracuse eliminated. And then after that, Russell came in, and Russell sort of dominated. Everything. Even with the arrival of Wilt Chamberlain in 1959, Philadelphia couldn't topple the Celtics, but it became an epic rivalry. The games against Wilt and Russell were great because we had a good team, but Boston had a great team. It bothers me when people say that Russell continually outplayed Wilt, and his team beat us, no question about it. Look at the statistics, but they were a better team. I played against Boston teams that had eight guys in the Hall of Fame. We had three, Tommy, myself, and Will. Into Arizona, and he's terrific. Man, what talent in this game. We were a good team, good players, but just not as good. And they had tremendous battles, as I said. But nights when we lost, I, re I really had a difficult time sleeping because I never really played ball for money. I played to win, and when I didn't win, I was very, very frustrated because I'm not a believer, I guess, in the philosophy that it's if, if you play a good game and you lose, that's fine. I, I don't think that. I'd rather play a rotten game and win because when you win, it erases all your mistakes. The mistakes don't mean, didn't mean a thing, and that's the important thing in my eyes. Arizona can shoot him from anywhere. An uncanny sense of timing and unbelievable accuracy make Paul a marvelous man to watch. We were not in a situation as the players are today where after playing several years you can figure you'll never have to work again. That was certainly not the case. Everybody during that time, and I was the same, everybody during that time worked during the summer. You had to work to make ends meet. And I worked with a Valentine beer distributor in Philly for a couple of summers and I worked with IBM for a summer. With Boston dominating the league, Paul had decided to retire. But he agreed to play in 1962, the Warriors' last season in Philadelphia, before moving west. I determined I was going to quit. And I worked all that summer with IBM, and I loved the company. I thought it was a great company to work for. And then Eddie came out and talked to my wife and myself, and he gave me a substantial raise, and he said, well, we can, we can beat Boston this year. And I said, well, maybe we can. The Warriors keep fighting from behind. Paul Arizon hits with a one-hander. So I worked it out with IBM that I would take a temporary leave of absence and come back the next year to give it one more shot. And I did give it one more shot, and again we lost in a very heartbreaking seventh game. It's all over. The Boston Celtics are once again the world champions. The frustration of losing continually to Boston was one of the reasons why I decided to quit playing. Because when I stopped in 62, I was still averaging 21, 22 points a game, so I had a lot of good basketball left in me, I felt. The fact it made it easier that I was moving to San Francisco, which I hadn't had to, uh, dangled in front of me the prior year. And I didn't want to leave, because at that time, all my roots are in this area, my wife's roots are in this area. I said, I have an opportunity to get back with IBM, which I think again is a great company. If I don't go back now, I'm probably going to lose it, and I'm getting older. You know, I'm not making enough money to get us through the rest of our lives. I have to start thinking of myself and thinking of my family from that perspective. So Nettie would always try to get me to go out to San Francisco, and I said, Ed, I made my decision. And I'm glad I did, because I'll tell you personally, I made far more money with IBM than I did with the Warriors, which is, an, and I'm not in the IBM Hall of Fame. <laughs> but it worked out well. Even though he was still playing at a high level, Paul had no regrets about retiring. He had given everything he had on the court. I'd like to say, I think I earned my money with the Warriors. As I said, we didn't. I think my top salary was in the $30,000 area around there. Although when the team moved out to San Francisco, when I decided not to return, I got offers of a bigger increase than I had ever gotten in my life, but I decided not to take it. 
With basketball behind him, Paul built a second career in the business world. He worked full-time at IBM right up until his retirement. I've been retired for 20 years, okay? I worked for IBM for 23 years after leaving the Warriors, and, and I happen to love it. I can do whatever I want when, when I want. If I have five children, 14 grandchildren, who live in the area, see them almost not on a daily basis, but certainly on a weekly basis, which is very important to me. And I love to read. To me, a great day would just be sitting down reading for 10 hours. So. I would say in the 20 years I've been retired, I haven't been bored for one day. I'm, a, I'm an abider of that philosophy that boring people get bored. And as I said, I, I enjoy, I've loved it. And fortunately, you know, financially, I'm able to do that, which is very, very important. Looking back on his career, he's proud of his role as one of the players who paved the way for the NBA's success. It feels good being a pioneer, but, you know, initially the the person that held the league together when it first started was Joe Fultz, no question. And Mike came in, and then Cousy followed from there. Now, I was not a spectacular player. I think if you would have to categorize the type of player I was, I think I was steady. There you see him, number 11, making one of his spectacular jump shots. You could generally count on me for, you know, a 18 to 24 point contribution every game. I didn't have a lot of great games. I didn't have a lot of bad games, but I, I was pretty steady. But as I said, I was sort of a, a semi-unknown pioneer, as I say. Paul's greatness was recognized in 1970 when he was named to the NBA's Silver Anniversary Team. Seven years later, he was elected to the Basketball Hall of Fame. And in 1996, he took his place among the game's legends. Now, let's meet the 50 greatest players in NBA history. Ladies and gentlemen, the forwards. With the top 50 players, I don't know if I was surprised when being inducted and elected or whether somebody up there likes me or something, but it worked out beyond my wildest dreams. I guess that's the best way to categorize it. From the Philadelphia Warriors, number 11, Pitchin Paul Arizon. Not bad for a guy who was at best an all-star intramural player in high school. For Paul Arizon, his years in basketball were filled with highlights, but there are certain moments that will always stand out. My lasting memories, first of all, are winning a championship. Secondly, of not winning more. Thirdly, of those two all-star games that we beat the heck out of Mike and his team. And as I said, I just can't stress how satisfying that was to me. And as I said, it was a good career. I, I think, uh, you know, we weren't rich, but we didn't want to be rich. We had enough money. We were making more than the average guy was, the average college graduate at that time. And things worked out well. I don't think I would do one thing differently. So I, I couldn't be happier. So a player who couldn't even make his high school team ended up making it all the way to the Hall of Fame. As one of the top players of the 50s, Paul Arizon was part of the very foundation of the NBA, and he helped make the jump shot a standard part of the game, not to mention being one of the first players to hang in midair to get off his shot. Paul Arizon was truly a shooting star whose legacy shines brightly in NBA history. That's all the time we have for today's show. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on NBA TV Basketballography.